town. We're happy to be here. Playing for half the door and maybe a few beers. Ah, uh, here's an idea. Before this whole night goes south. Al Floss presents the complete and alarming history of America's greatest garage band, The Stools. 1959 was a pivotal year in the history of The Stools. Plans were underway for a U.S. style rock and roll package tour to hit Europe with The Stools, Conway Twitty, Dwayne Eddy, Bobby Darin, Dale Hawkins, the Ponytails and local guest Cliff Richards all on the bill. At the time, the Stools were having a little trouble getting their songs in the BBC. Remember, we're talking about uptight Brits here. The BBC had banned the kosher song Charlie Brown, for Christ's sakes, because it mentioned spitballs. You can imagine what they thought of the Stool songs, like All of Me. Early rock was a primitive, repetitive music, and while Little Richard or Chuck Berry might have been singing about sexual identity or race, it was so steeped in code as to be all but invisible. And for all their rebel brashness, the actual lyrics from an Elvis Presley song or Buddy Holly could have just as easily been lifted from a 1940s love song. The rock and rollers might have been mad dogs, but they were safely chained to the house. The stools got loose, ran around the neighborhood a bit with the single All of Me. The 1959 European tour was a dream, no problems at all. Well, in Paris, the manager of the Lido Club got pissy, but that was about it. In 1959, Elvis Presley was in the army, stationed in Germany, and he gets a 15-day furlough that he's supposed to use to visit Brigitte Bardot as some sort of hands-across-the-water PR stunt. But what happens is, the stools are staying at the Prince de Gaulle Hotel on the Champs-Élysées, just down the road from the Lido Club, home to the famous Bluebell Girls, a dance troupe. Elvis meets up with his old friends, the Stools. They take in the show at the Lido, and it all ends with a manager from the Lido and his bouncers storming the band's hotel room and releasing the girls just in time for their show the next night. So Elvis is so hungover after his time with the Stools that he can't even think about getting on an airplane unless you were talking about getting the barf bag out before they even start rolling the wheels. He has to spend 800 bucks, which was a lot of money back then, even to the king, to rent a limo to drive him back to the base before he gets listed as AWOL. Terry Denny was at the party that night too. Terry Denny and Elvis did not get along. The Stools first met Terry Denny during their first trip to England with Bill Haley and his Comets. One night they went out to the Two Eyes coffee bar because it was a hip place to go. 
That's where Cliff Richards, Tommy Steele, and Adam Faith all got their start. Terry Denny was singing that night. I remember Elvin Anderson saying the only reason they went to the Two Eyes is because the Australian wrestler Dr. Death owned the club and he was a big fan. The Two Eyes was a dive. The music was in the basement on this little foot and a half stage. Bunch of two by fours on milk crates, one mic, speakers on the wall. But there was a skiffle group called the Vipers playing there that the stools wanted to check out. So Peter Grant, who would go on to become Led Zeppelin's manager, used to work the door as a bouncer there. I don't know if Al Floss and Grant ever spoke that night, but Grant sure did adopt Floss's a scorched earth band management technique later on. After his set, Terry Denny and the stools went down the street to the Cat's Whiskers, which was this ultra hip Soho bar, and became friends over several drinks. So Terry Denny was soon to be touted as the English Elvis. He really did have an unbelievable voice. Really, his first three singles all landed on the charts. In 1958, Antonio Moretti auditioned for a movie called The Golden Disc, although I think at the time the working title was The In-Between Age, just a cheap little rock and roll exploitation film directed by Don Sharp. This was early in his career, before Sharp made all those great Hammer studio films like The Kiss of the Vampire. Antonio seemed to have the part of the pop singer in the movie all sewed up, and then out of nowhere, Terry Denny gets the part. To his credit, to show that there's no hard feelings, Antonio later takes Denny out for a drink. In the late 1950s, when the press were looking for someone to point to as an example of the evils of rock and roll, they would point to Terry Denny in his night out with Antonio. Although, thanks to some hard work on the part of Al Floss, Antonio doesn't get mentioned in many of these stories. Let's take a moment to think about rock music, shan't we? What is rock? Literally, it's an immobile mass of stone or figuratively similar phenomenon, while at the same time it can be an unsettling movement or action. You'd have to agree that the stools, for good or ill, are rock. The way I heard the story told, Antonio and Terry Denny go out for several drinks. I mean, several. Denny is knee-walking drunk by the time Antonio gets done with him. At the time, Denny was married to Edna Savage, a pop singer with some minor success. Antonio tells the drunk Denny that he's been having an affair with Edna, which may or may not have been true, but Denny flies into a rage, throws a cinder block through a store window, tries to get his wife on the phone, but when he can't, he rips the phone right out of the box. So in the 50s, there were no cell phones there, kids. If you were out and you wanted to make a call, you had to use this thing called a phone booth, and maybe uh, have a thing called change in your pocket to actually use the phone. Much like the TARDIS in Doctor Who, only without all that time travel and all that other crap. So, Denny is sitting there in the street sobbing, and the cops show up and arrest him. Antonio is nowhere to be found. Rather than jail time, Denny was conscripted into the Army for national service. He had a tour booked, so they let him put going into the Army off for a little bit, which the press had a field day with. But when he finally joins the King's Royal Rifle Corps, he gets kicked out after two months for being medically unfit. I heard he failed the psych eval. The tabloids went nuts. Elvis, of course, was in the army at this time, and they start saying Terry Denny was less of a man than Elvis, and all this other stuff. The public turns on him, and his career as a rock singer is all but over. Well, sure, the bad press hurt him. It didn't do much for his career, though, once it got out that <laughs> he was actually married, the poor slob. So he did what anyone would do in his place, became an evangelist, recording gospel albums and such. He's not the last guy to find God after a night drinking with a stool, let me tell you. He returned to rock in the 80s trying to cash in on the revival craze, but that didn't last. And I'm told he was married to some countess and she's bankrolling in his latest comeback bid. Well, it's what I'd call the curse of the Two Eyes coffee bar. You know who else played there? <laughs> Gary Glitter. Hello. Need I say more? Hi, I'm famous radio personality Charles Laquadera here to tell you about a fantastic offer from our friends at Dutchco. It's a brand spanking new long playing album called Jukebox Explosion, The Hits of the Stools. And you can only get it by taking advantage of this TV offer. That's right, Charles, Jukebox Explosion, The Hits of the Stools, is only available for a limited time. And you get such great hits as 
the jukebox lied again, cap lock voice, and the always popular, her body has gone to her head. I went to see the gypsy to have my fortune told. She said that it cost 50. But that's not all. You also get the hits Frat Girl, Jackson Hole, and What's That You Say? What about my favorite? Shut up and hold mummy's Merlot. You know it, Charles. Everybody's favorite jukebox songs of the stools are included in this massive two-disc set. So call now, and you could be enjoying songs like A Lotta Coladas within four to six weeks. Don't like the telephone? And who does? Just mail your check to Dutchco Teleproducts, Inc., Elks Grove Village, Illinois, 90007, USA. Because if it says it's Dutchco, it's so-so. Above all else, Al Floss was a salesman. He didn't care what the stools recorded, as long as they gave him product to sell. Didn't matter if it was rock and roll, pop, folk songs, just give him product to move. Except reggae. Floss wouldn't touch reggae records. He hated the emphasis being on the three rather than the one, which is why it was a little more than surprising that he picked My Girl Louie for the single to work in the States while the band was in Europe. The Stool's music in this early period was the sound of crap. That's not an indictment, but an encomium. They chewed up the very best of the music around them, digested it, removed the needed nutrients, and then passed it in a completely new form. She's my girl, Louie, Louie, move on. Just for show It's easy for him Like saying hello And it takes off Like a UFO Shoot had been playing live since 1953, but they didn't get around to recording it until after the fourth album, 1959's Meet the Stools. So there's an interesting history to this song. See, back in 53, there was this doo-wop group called The Flares. They never amounted to too much, but one of the members, Richard Berry, caught the ear of Lieber and Stoller, who used Berry's voice on the bass part of that Robin's hit, Riot in Cell Block Number 9. He also sang on Etta James's The Wallflower before he started his own group, The Pharaohs. So The Pharaohs get a gig on the bill with Elvin Anderson and Rick Rolera and the Rhythm Rockers, a Mexican-American band out of Anaheim that did a killer cover version of Rene Touzette's El Loco Cha-Cha. Sitting backstage, allegedly writing on a roll of toilet paper, Barry marries Anderson's Move On Louie with the Cha-Cha rhythm of The Rhythm Rockers and the song Louie Louie is born. 
That's how some rock songs get written. A pinch from here, a dash from there, boom. You can hear Move On Louie and El Loco Cha Cha in Louie Luai, but there are also equal parts Calypso Blues from Nat King Cole, Chuck Berry's Havana Moon, and even Johnny Mercer's One For My Baby and One More For The Road in the lyrics, the way it's a confessional to a bartender. This song is indicative of all stools music. It's a contradictory sound. It's the bolt that both secures and flees, the clip that cuts and fastens, the buckle to connect and break from the past. It is a dusting that not only adds fine particles, but removes them. But then contradictions are the backbone of life, uh, the heart of rock and roll, if you will. People don't think twice about downloading music illegally off the internet, but would never actually go into a CD store and shoplift. How many people do you know, perhaps even you yourself, who candidly deny the very possibility that any other god exists outside of the one in your personal belief system, and yet become quite defensive if anyone else has the same point of view? Contradictions, my friend, like the stool's music, are all around us, a uh, part of the fabric of us. The Pharaohs put out the single Louis Louie, but it didn't really do anything. In fact, it wasn't even the A-side of the 45. You Are My Sunshine was. LA DJ Hunter Hancock started playing Louie Louie, and pretty soon it became a standard on all the West Coast Garage Band's playlists. It went up as far as Seattle, where Rockin' Robert and the Whalers had a minor hit with it as well. Of course, the Kingsmen from Portland, Oregon would hear Rockin' Robert's version and decide to cut their own, unintelligible version in 1963. And a rock and roll classic is born. Naturally, Richard Berry would get nothing from the Kingsmen taking his song to number two on the charts. In 1959, he sold the publishing rights for Louie Louie and a bunch of his other songs to Flip Records for 750 bucks because he was getting married and needed the cash. The movie Animal House in 1978 probably did more to make Louie Louie the ubiquitous party song that it's become than anything the Kingsmen did in the 60s. Which is sad, because by the 80s, Richard Berry was staying at his mother's house in South Central and living off food stamps. Of course, California coolers would change all that. California coolers were a sickly sweet sangria type drink originally named Canada Coolers. But once they were rebranded by Glenn Martinez and Associates, they took off, reportedly having sales of $146 million in 1985. Bartles and James and Seagram's started cutting into the market so California Cooler decided to launch a new campaign featuring the song Louie Louie. Thankfully, California Cooler's lawyers did their due diligence, reviewed the paper trail on Louie Louie, and realized that Richard Berry would have to approve the commercial and he had been illegally deprived of millions of dollars in back royalties. Richard Berry got a massive settlement and even reformed the Pharaohs for a tour in 1995. Things didn't work out as well for California Coolers. Their ads were no match for Bartles and James ads featuring a fictitious Bartles and James and the tagline, thank you for trying our product, and overall sales dropped 98% from 1987 to 1996. Rock bands and visual artists have always gone hand in hand. Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground, Roger Dean and Yes, Pedro Bell and the Funkadelic. Um, Guys that did all that Pink Floyd stuff. Robert Brownjohn was a graphic artist, probably best known for his work on the title sequences for a couple of James Bond movies. He had this incredible use of wit and risque humor that were his calling cards. So you'd think it'd be a perfect fit with the stools. Brownjohn did that great Let It Bleed cover with the cake and the bike tire and all that for the Rolling Stones in 69. But 10 years earlier, the stool started tapping him for their covers. So Brown John had been designing covers for jazz artists over at Columbia Records, and then by 59, his hmm, heroin addiction, like real surprise story in rock and roll, had gotten out of hand, and he left New York for London. The Stools paid Brown John for cover art, but who actually designed the covers is still somewhat of a mystery. Brown John was a full-blown junkie at this point, and it was unlikely he had any idea of what was going on. The photographer Bob Moreland was working with the Stools around this time too. 
He had a treasure trove of shots he took of the stools from the 50s. Bob is probably best known for the iconic early photos he took of Elvis Presley before Elvis got huge, both literally and figuratively. The stools were born of fear. The complacency of the 50s quickly gave way to it. Certainly the Russians were part of that, but the most damaging fear came from within. Homegrown communists, the Negro and women asking for equal rights, sexual deviance. Babies born in the 40s became the teenagers of the 50s, and they were weaned on a military industrial complex's teat that made bomb shelters in your backyard commonplace. But no amount of napalm and defoliation could hold back the invasion of the stools. And Bob Moreland was just the photographer to document that. Moreland took a bunch of shots of the stools. I think he was working for Life magazine at the time. Al Floss had broken some sort of exclusive deal with them, and Bob got total access to the band. But then, when it was over, Floss confiscated all the film. I don't know if it ever even got developed. And if the shots do turn up, and I'm in them, I can tell you right now, it was totally photoshopped. I wasn't even in the country at the time. Well, regardless of what happened to those photographs, we'll watch the band's career as it develops next time, as the complete and alarming history of America's greatest garage band, The Stools, continues. Join us then. Won't you? She came down to the islands Cause she believed the Buffett song Left her future in Rhode Island <laughs> I guess that wasn't so wrong wasn't much to write on my mouth, but the package was pure drop dead. Now her body has gone to her head.